Gentlemen, welcome to the Gerda Podcast. My name is Charlie Ungemach. I'm the founder and curator of this project. It is my dream child. It's a reflection of what I truly believe and what I have learned in uh, my study of scripture and of masculinity. And I look forward to being able to share more and more and more of it with you. I hope that it's an aid to you on your journey towards being the man that God created you to be. This episode of the Geared Up Podcast is sponsored by the Christ for Disciples Podcast, put out by Pastor Paul Steinberg, who is he has his doctorate in divinity, which is awesome. He himself is the father of five sons. It applies God's word to raising the next generation. So take 10 minutes each weekday to listen to the Christ for Disciples podcast and get direction and gospel power to disciple the youngest generation. Subscribe to the Christ for Disciples podcast at ChristForDisciples.com or on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts from. That's ChristForDisciples.com, especially you folks who are stuck in a house with your kids during this social distancing time away from school. It's a great resource to help you remember who you are, what your role is, and how we uh, raise our children in the way um, and prepare them for lives of service to their creator and to their king. Uh, Let's get started with our show today. You are listening to the Gird Up Podcast. To gird up is an ancient way of preparing oneself for hard work or a battle ahead. Our work is to reclaim masculinity in the modern world and to live out our calling as men of God. Here you will find a community of believers working hard to become the men that God created us to be. Now it's time to roll up your sleeves and let's get to work. All right, fellas, this is part one of a three-part series um, based on what I was going to talk about at the Iron Men of God Men's Conference that got canceled at the end of last month uh, because of the coronavirus. Now, if I had had the opportunity to um, present this at the Iron Men of God Conference, it would have probably been a little bit shorter. Um, I only had 45 minutes to present then. Uh, but that's part of the reason it's only coming to you now via podcast is that I wanted to soup it up, put a little bit more time and effort into it. Um, uh, not because it wasn't complete, but because I felt that I could be clearer. I felt that I could provide more information and, and just do an even better job with even more time. So we're going to split it up into three sections. We're going to split it up into three sections. This is part one, um, talking about the lies that the world tells us about masculinity and manhood. Now, I will boldly say that this is my manifesto, this three-part series here. Um, if I had a manifesto, this would be it. Right? Um, this is what I've spent the last several years of my life doing and studying um, in almost all of my free time, everything from the movies I watch to the books I read to the things I'm interested in, the people I meet and have conversations with, um, a, the vast majority of my personal time, of my free time, has either been in the pursuit of this information um, and the study of this concept, of these concepts, um, or in my you know battles to get myself uh, on the ball and actually go out and do the studying and do the work um, to build this kind of a uh, of a lecture, if you will. Uh, so I'm super excited to share it with you. Like I said, this is part one. There'll be two more parts to come with it. Um, today, we're simply going to debunk the things of the world. We're going to debunk the ideas of the world. We're going to debunk the ideas that the world puts out there in regards to manhood and masculinity. And it all starts with the same question, right? What does it mean to be a man or what makes and constitutes a man? I've been asking people this question for years now. Um, and every single man has given me a different answer. You've listened to him. If you haven't listened to him, go back and listen to the interviews all the way back to that very first Kevin Festerling interview three years ago or two years ago in my kitchen, two and a half years ago in my kitchen. The question has been the same and I've never gotten the same answer twice. Never gotten the same answer twice. It's the question that's at the very center of everything. Every political debate we're a part of, every personal conflict with everybody else, um, every single decision that we make, everything we eat, the choices that we make about what we eat, what we choose to drink, the emotions we feel, the way that we act, um, how we think about others, how we perceive the world, all of this and more is wrapped up and wrapped around the answer to the question, what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a man? 
Now, I figured (laughs) that if I, at the age of 18, typed into Google, what does it mean to be a man? I figured other people probably did too. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to type it in. I'm going to take the first five answers I can find. I'm going to put them up here. So these are the first five answers I found when I typed, what does it mean to be a man, into Google. The first one uh, comes from the article, what does it mean to be a man, on the website Being. It's written by Jonathan P. Higgins. He says, it behooves me to say that the root definition of what it means to be a man or to perform masculinity here in America continues to be grounded in oppression, marginalization, and white supremacy. That's his definition of what it means to be a man. The next one came from Harry's, the website called Harry's. Uh, It actually came from an article on Wired. What does it mean to be a real man anyway? And he says, today there is a broader range of role models than ever before. But more importantly, there's a wide number of pathways that should all be seen as equally masculine. Again, that's how he defined masculinity. That's how he defined what it means to be a man, that there's a whole bunch of different ways you can be a man. That's all he said. The third is written by Sean Swaby, who's a therapist and a blogger um, who participates in the Good Men Project. And Sean, the therapist, says, Manliness is knowing yourself, being honest with yourself, but it is more. It is the choice to be fully human. So Sean would say that uh, being a man is all about being human. It's all about being you, being yourself. The fourth um, is from Professor Professor Michael Kimmel, who was having a conversation with Jill Kransky in the uh, magazine Esquire. And Professor Michael Kimmel said, young men today see, see being nurturing, caring, and being a great dad as what being a man is all about. It's a little less offensive, um, but being nurturing, caring, and being a great dad is what being a man is all about. The last one um, is somebody that you'd think would be kind of on our side of things, if you will. Um, He's a blogger talking about being men and hearkening the idea that we should go back to being classical men the way men used to be, right? Uh, It's a guy named Andrew Farabee. Um, And this is from his uh, article, A Brief Essay on How to Be a Man, What Makes a Man a Real Man, uh, which was publicized on Knowledge for, it's a website called Knowledge for Men. And Andrew said, whichever you are experiencing, I'm sorry, wherever you are experiencing the most pain in your life, financially, romantically, physically, go there. Solve the problems that are facing you. Commit to overcoming your obstacles, come hell or high water. Refuse to be denied by the size of your, refuse to be defined, I'm sorry, by the size of your biceps, your bank account, or the woman on your arm. Create your own definition of masculinity and live it to its fullest. It is only by doing this that you will truly become a grounded man. I thought he was on the right track for a little while. He's talking about not, what not to plant your identity, and I can agree with him on all those, but he comes right back to the same thing everybody else said. Create your own definition of masculinity and live it to the fullest. The world has all kinds of answers to this question, and most people don't agree. In fact, (laughs) there are almost as many answers to the question, what does it mean to be a man, as there are people to ask the question, what does it mean to be a man? Everybody thinks that they have an answer, but when the answer comes from any place other than the one who created us, the answer comes from anywhere other than the creator, it's going to fall pathetically short. The world is wrong about masculinity, and the world is wrong, thank goodness, about manhood. Our modern society today laughs at this idea of a benevolent and almighty and and omnipotent creator. They deny God, and when we deny God, we step outside of our traditional values, in quotation marks, right? They, they, but they step outside of traditional values. They dismiss traditional value as social construction or the creation of men over time, and they claim that our modern times, that in our modern times here, we need a new and modern set of values and rules. But when we step outside of that traditional morality of the past, that natural order as God intended and created— 
We are no longer, all of a sudden, we are no longer governed by God's laws of nature, and we are no longer accountable to him, but we're accountable to another person. As soon as we step outside of accountability to God, out of God's natural order, we are accountable to another person, another sinful human whose values are accountable to no one but their own authors. They are only accountable to themselves, not to a higher omnipotent power as God. In other words, those who now sit in the place of God at the top of society serve as our conscience and our motivators, but they themselves who sit at the top of society are also able to live outside of the constraints of the morality that they curate. The people that sit on top of the food chain don't have to live by the same laws as everybody else, don't have to live by the same rules as everybody else, because they're top dog. They're accountable only to themselves. The ultimate goal of any substitute morality, any morality other than the natural order, the traditional value, the way God created, is, is not to grant freedom to the captives as they claim they're all going to tell you that they're setting people free but their purpose is not to grant freedom their purpose is to enslave more captives for themselves the goal is not to create authentic and empowered men the goal of the world the goal of these quote-unquote new moralities is to reduce men to artifacts to reduce people in general to artifacts that can be used manipulated bought sold and bargained with and that's not just masculinity we just happen to be talking about masculinity right now and this process is not necessarily overt like you'd think they start chipping away at the bedrock of our faith the belief that there is a God and that he created us with identity and purpose and that we are accountable to him without that without that bedrock foundation everything else falls apart and they know that and while some people will some loud and bold few will actually attack directly the faith that we cherish well, some people will just take that full frontal assault on our faith. Most people don't. Most philosophers don't. What most people will do when they're trying to undermine the Christian faith, they will subliminally work to crack the cornerstone, right? Intellectuals will point back to this time before morality, right? This time supposedly where primal instincts compelled our ancestors to behave certain ways and call for us to return to such basic primal instincts before there was religion, before there was anything else, right? We talk about survival of the fittest, right? It's the concept on which evolution was built. They say that was all existing before uh religion ever did. But the behavior involved in the manifestation of survival of the fittest isn't best described as um, survival of the fittest. The better way to say that, the better way to describe that, is actually preservation of the species. Right? Survival of the fittest and preservation of the species are the same concept. And they're the idea that even in nature, living things are willing to sacrifice one life for the sake of the collective lives of the species. Or that uh, species are going to make choices, they're going to, um, even if they're not conscious they're going to be their behaviors are going to cause the survival of the species right the survival the preservation of the species it's it's the recognition of the idea that even in nature living things are willing to sacrifice one life for the collective lives of the species it's a recognition that life is precious it's a selfless act of sacrifice and isn't this a moral concept is it not the same concept that led Jesus to declare that no love is greater than for one man to lay down his life for his friends or that we should all do to others as we would have them do unto us? This is truly a return to square one. It is primal instinct. But that primal instinct doesn't go back beyond creation. That primal instinct doesn't prove that there's no God. In fact, it's proof of morality and the fact that morality is beyond time and before time. Aristotle and Plato both operated under the assumption that all men had ingrained in their basic makeup, calling it reason or conscience, a natural knowledge of right and wrong. They agreed that we have primal instincts, and they claimed, they believed that those primal instincts right, were reason and conscience, a natural knowledge of right and wrong. Early Hindus called it the rata, I think it's how you say it, it's spelled R-T-A or Ta, and the Chinese call it the Tao, 
And as C.S. Lewis declares in The Abolition of Man, it is nature. It is the way, the road. It is the way in which the universe goes on, the way in which things everlastingly emerge, stilly and tranquilly into space and time. It is also the way which every man should tread in imitation of that cosmic and supercosmic progression, conforming all activities to the great exemplar. In other words, the way of nature, the true path, the rata, the tau, they all, from all over the world, from all time, they all reflect the same concept. Men should imitate the creator. The men should imitate nature, the true path, the rata, the tau, right? They all reflect the same concept. That they are, that men are, they should imitate the creator to whom they are accountable. That there is a creator, men should imitate the creator because they are accountable to the creator. This way has never changed ever in all of time and not even a slight bit of change and that never will. And so when the great thinkers and philosophers of the modern era claim to have made advances or innovations in morality, they take another step off of the ancient and timeless way of life. They get further and further and further from God's way. They get further and further and further from the way, from the Tao, from the natural order of things. We see this all around us, particularly in the politics of our age, and uh, politics of all ages, of all times, of all the past. But we're familiar, we're most familiar with the politics of our own age, so that's what we'll talk about, right? And it's the first example here is 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 capitalism and socialism, right? They kind of go hand in hand. It's, uh, pure capitalism and pure socialism both thrive on the same concept that a few on the socialist side they're usually elected, and on the capitalist side they're one, right? They're titans in in industry, but those few control all the money and all the resources, while this minority who controls everything is benevolent and good-hearted. Everybody's happy, right? So capitalists they have uh, people sitting on top of the food chain who control all the money and make sure that everything's running. Right? In socialism, you have the government controlling everything. And while the people who sit on top are good-hearted, they're happy, they are kind and benevolent, the people are happy and they create for themselves a nice little utopia on earth. But the love of money and power corrupts. That utopia is what we're aiming for. But it doesn't last because the love of money and power corrupts. And without fail, that utopia is quickly corrupted and becomes an absolute nightmare for everyone except for the few people who sit at the top of the pyramid who control everything. They've been put in the seat of God and they are not accountable to God. They sit in God's throne, but they're not accountable to God. And this is where the travesties like North Korea or the USSR or China or more recently Venezuela, right? The terrible things happening in Venezuela. It's where Nazi Germany went off the rails. It's where the child labor of the early industrialized Britain happened, right? That's why. Um, the Empire of Japan and World War II, the Holy Roman Empire, which ushered in the Dark Ages because of its nonsense, and we can go on and on and on, pointing out all these different places where either a socialist or capitalist entity um, just went off the rails. At some point, these uh, processes, which turned out to be evil and wicked and, and allowed evil, wicked leaders to come to the top, at some point, they were able to convince the majority of a race of people or races of people to sell their souls and their freedom for the sake of political and societal gain. Another example would be radical feminism. Right, right now, all right, so radical feminism was a movement that was built on a platform of suffrage, right? A platform of equal rights and personal freedoms. The concept that a woman is equal in value, purpose, and potential to a man, and this is a good thing. It's appropriate, and appropriate feminism is rooted in truth. And the truth at the beginning was that many women in the Western world, particularly in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, were treated as less than equal. They were second-class citizens in many places and at many times, and they were treated as the property of men. And their, quote, liberation was appropriate and reflected the created order that was established by God. Right? It was a thing Christians could get behind. It was a good thing that men and women were created equal in the eyes of God and everyone should see them that way. But this is no longer the goal or the practice of most feminists, particularly the radical feminists of our age. 
And there's a lot of them. Modern feminism now actually scorns and shames conservative women who choose to adhere to natural to the traditional values of ages past, right? And, and and choose to stay at home and be stay-at-home moms and housewives. They claim that those women are impeding progress and they actually stand against women, which is nonsense. It's the same movement that once sought equality and equity, but now it seeks to flip the seeks to flip the patriarchy on its head and turn it into a matriarchy. Linda Gordon, a leader in the feminist movement, said the nuclear family must be destroyed, whatever its ultimate meaning. The breakup of families now is an objectively revolutionary process. And Sally Miller Gerhardt, in her book, The Future, If There Is One Is Female, which is a big-time seller, said that the proportion of men must be reduced to and maintained at approximately 10% of the human race. Again, she said the proportion of men must be reduced to and maintained at approximately 10% of the human race. Now, most women would be revolted by such, such statements if they stood on their own. But by subtle and consistent subliminal and overt messaging over time, there are millions of women all over our nation and all over the Western world who have taken the bait hook, line, and sinker and hitched themselves to a radical, fascist, even genocidal, as we just saw, a genocidal ideal under the pretense that they themselves are the actual victims. They're no longer independent thinkers seeking equality. They're often hysterical, childish, and narcissistic, vagina-hat-wearing radicals. They're no longer independent. They're sheep. The same thing, though, I'm not just picking on the left, the same thing can be said about a lot of abortion reform. Um, during the 2016 presidential and congressional elections, several clergy and chaplains on Capitol Hill alleged that the reason abortion reform has yet to be passed in any productive way is that many of the conservative lawmakers who use a pro-life platform to get, I'm sorry, not many of them, many conservative lawmakers who use a pro-life platform to get elected are hesitant to repeal Roe v. Wade because at some point their own careers have been aided by a discreet abortion and that the repeal of such legislation would mean a lifestyle change and future political risk for themselves. They're afraid that they'll lose power. Now, not much came of this accusation. It wasn't well documented or publicized, and it may have been an overstatement, but it stands to make my point that we sell our souls, we trade our power to people who themselves do not live under the same laws we do. They themselves do not live under the law. They sit in the seat of God and are accountable to no one. They're not accountable to us. They're not accountable to God. And this happens in the church too. There are three basic ways that many churches and church bodies keep money coming in and keep butts in pews. One, they'll convince people that they must do good things in order to be saved, right? We call this works righteousness. And of course, the best good things that you can do are to give money to the church and worship regularly. Bonus points if you usher, <laughs> if you usher or you help them mow the grass, right? So many churches declare works righteousness, right? Um, the second way they keep people coming is they preach some kind of pr prosperity gospel under the guise that those who love God will manifest for themselves all kinds of earthly blessings. And of course, you got to remember, the, the, the easiest way to make sure those blessings happen is to give money to the church. Yeah, It's a God helps those who helps themselves message. And it's not true. The third group... Um, based their preaching on the notion that everything is hunky-dory, that, that God loves everybody and every, anything goes, and that all religion is the same. Basically, they use church instead of religion as a social club. The first of these, the idea of works righteousness, paints everybody either as a pathetic, miserable failure who can never be good enough or as a being who's holier than everyone else. And we all know that if somebody's holier than thou, that in time... They're going to be exposed as a hypocrite because no one is righteous. No one can be good enough. The second, those who preach a prosperity gospel, they paint people, or I'm sorry, they produce selfish and self-centered greed machines who are only out for personal gain. They don't actually produce Christians. And the last, the, the candy cane, cotton candy churches, right? They produce soft, effeminate men with weak spines and even weaker morality because they said anything goes. They said all religions are the same. They don't have a backbone. The world doesn't want men. 
The world wants cattle. The world doesn't want independent thinkers. They want to hitch men to the plow and use them to their advantage because they're not accountable to a benevolent, omniscient, omnipotent, and almighty creator. They're accountable to their passions and desires alone because they dismiss the idea that God even exists. We are presented with a quote-unquote modern masculinity then that is a patchwork quilt of ideas, virtues, practices, and traditions that is totally subjective and without accountability and not rooted in a bedrock foundation of truth and doesn't even serve us. It serves other people who sit at the top of the pyramid. It's a house built on shifting sand and it will crumble. Now, these are big claims and bold statements, and a lot of times people shy away from such ideas and claims because there's an implication that we ourselves as men are dumb, idiotic, idealistic sheep, and nobody likes to or wants to feel that way, and it's an attack on our very identity, but that's exactly what we need. We need to understand and examine where we draw our identities from so that we can, to borrow from Jesus' parable, build our houses on solid ground. It's easy to think that a building is solid and safe on a normal day under peaceful times. But when an earthquake shakes the city or bombs are dropped by the enemy or a fire starts in the kitchen, the true integrity of a structure will be exposed. And that's why we are, have building inspectors that come and look at our houses, right? We have building codes to guide our buildings, our construction, so that when the day of disaster comes, we're prepared and the house is built on solid ground. And this is the same for our identities, right? When we go untested, when things are peaceful, when our businesses are successful, when there's plenty of money in the bank, our relationships are good, our children are healthy, and we tend to forget about the foundation, the cornerstone on which our lives are built, we begin to put, build our identities on shifting sands, on things that change, on qualities, on possessions, on status, on achievements, on relationships, all things which can be washed out from under us. It's good to take pride in being a good dad, and a good man does it well, but who are you? When your children are taken away, when they get sick, when tragedy strikes and one of your children dies, who are you then if your identity was put into being a good dad? It's good to be put your marriage first. It's good to be a loving, doting husband and faithful companion. But who are you when she's taken away? When your family is torn apart by divorce, when death comes knocking, who are you? What will your identity be? It's wise and prudent to be shrewd with your money and invest it wisely. Wise stewards often amass wealth because even as Jesus said, if you can be trusted with few things, he will give you many. But who are you when the money's gone? When, when you lose your job, when you go into debt, when it all disappears, who are you then if your identity was based on your resources? Every man needs a battle to fight, and equality of opportunity and equity and political freedom are vital to our way of life as Americans. But who are you when your candidate loses or is exposed as a criminal or a fraud or when your party crosses a line that you can't stand for? Who are you then? What is your identity? And health. Health is important. We ought to totally... I'm sorry, we ought to faithfully and tenderly care for our bodies. It's a vessel from God. We're commanded to tend them well. We only ever get one of them. But who are you when you suddenly get sick, when you're ill, when you're stuck in bed, when you lose your ability to walk? When your health deteriorates, who will you be? Who are you? Does your identity change when these things are taken away? These are all foundations, and we can go on and on and talk about all kinds of other ones. These are all foundations upon which we try and build our identities as men. These are places from which we try to evoke manhood and masculinity. And all, these, all of these things are important. And they play roles in our lives as men. But we misunderstand. They are not the actual source of our masculinity or our strength. In fact, it's just the opposite. It is only when we draw on our true, vital, masculine strength that we can fulfill all these roles and fill them well as men. But from where... Does this masculinity come? Where is this wellspring of manliness and manhood? One of my favorite anecdotes, and one that I live by, is simple. When you buy a toaster, you get a book. Right? When you buy a car, you get a book. When you buy a TV, you get a book that goes with it. When you buy a computer, you get a, a, a book. When you Even your couch, right? pasted on the bottom of your couch is a little plastic bag, and inside of it is a book. And the same thing is true with your life. When God gives you a life, he gives you a book too. 
and our definition of masculinity has to be founded, planted, and rooted and centered in Scripture. I have to draw my identity as a man from the Word of God and from my relationship with the Heavenly Father. And I know it's a lot easier sometimes to be ignorant, to just walk through life believing that things are as they should be. And and Solomon points out in the book of Ezekiel that uh, the more wisdom you have, the harder life is, the more sad you are because you realize things are not as they ought to be. That might be true, but it's not an excuse for walking around blind. We need to examine who we are and what we are. We need to reject the masculinity of the world, reject the constructs of the world, and choose instead to plant our identity as Christians, our identity as humans, our identity as men, firmly in the Word of God and what He says about us. And when we do, it's the start. That's the foundation on which we can build masculinity. It's the foundation on which we should build our lives. So upcoming will be parts two and three. Part two is going to talk about what we learn about God from Jesus, what we learn about masculinity from Jesus. And part three is going to talk about our loving Heavenly Father. So I hope that uh, this has opened your eyes a little bit. I hope you understand. If you didn't, listen to it again. I hope that this continues to be a blessing to you as it has been to me. And I pray that you continue to walk in grace and knowledge of the truth. God's blessings, fellas. Thank you for listening to the Gird Up Podcast. If you like what you're hearing on our podcast, make sure you're sharing it with friends and family, men in your life who you think need to hear our message. You can find us on social media, on Facebook under the Gird Up Podcast, and there's a Gird Up community as well there where you can interact with other men on the journey toward Christian manhood. You can find us on Instagram as Gird Up underscore like underscore a underscore man. If you'd like to help us bring our message to more men just like you all around the world, you can hit up our Patreon account. Type in www.patreon.com forward slash Gird Up. And finally, please leave a five-star rating or review on whatever platform you use to listen to our podcast, whether it's iTunes or Spotify. What that does is it helps us get more attention in the podcast world and bring more men to our message. Thank you again for listening to our podcast. Thank you for all the ways you support us and help spread the word. Until next time, go gird up and be the man that God created you to be.